Hello, welcome to Hidden History, an odyssey through time. I'm your host, John Rodriguez, and this is the 10th and final episode of Season 1 of the podcast, A Minute's Freedom and More, The Motivational Story of Elizabeth Freeman. If you take the time to sit down and commit to the research, you will often find that history is filled with examples of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Almost two centuries after Elizabeth Mumbet Freeman filed her suit in court for her freedom, an unassuming woman named Rosa Parks changed history one hot summer's day by refusing to give up her seat on a bus. Parks' simple act of defiance helped fuel the civil rights movement. Like Rosa Parks, Elizabeth Freeman was an ordinary person who performed a remarkable act. Once she gained her freedom, Elizabeth raised her daughter, saved her hard-earned money, enjoyed the company of family and friends, and collected fine personal possessions that she once only dreamt of owning. Yet, like Parks and the other ordinary people who came before and after her, Elizabeth Freeman helped to change the course of history. Her court case, which resulted in her freedom from slavery, was a direct challenge to the very existence of slavery in the state of Massachusetts. It was the first of its kind, which made Elizabeth's case not only unique, but extremely important to American history. Elizabeth Mumbet Freeman is a reminder to all of us that one need not be famous, or a great speaker, or a great intellect to make a difference in the world. All one really needs to do is not be afraid to take a stand and fight for what you believe in, as Elizabeth did. Elizabeth's story is also a reminder that while it's fine to obsess over women like Oprah, Lizzo, and Michelle Obama, time would probably be better spent learning about and possibly admiring women like Elizabeth Freeman, Rosa Parks, and sculptor Augusta Savage, just to name a few. Elizabeth's story, hidden history that has remained long forgotten, is the story of an enslaved woman who fought for her freedom and a new nation that still had a lot to learn when it came to applying the principle of liberty to all citizens, despite their color. Elizabeth Freeman was born in Claverick, Columbia County, New York, as a slave to enslaved parents and referred to by the name Bet or Betty. Although her exact birth date is unknown, it is believed that she was born around the year 1744. She grew up on the plantation of a Dutchman, Peter Hagenboom, with her younger sister Lizzie. As an enslaved person, Bet had no control over her own life. She and her sister were very young when they learned this lesson. In 1758, Hagaboom died, and in his will, he left all his, quote, Negroes and Negresses, big and little, young and old, to all of his children. Bet and her sister were sent to live with one of Hagaboom's daughters, Hannah, and her husband, Colonel John Ashley, in Sheffield, Massachusetts. Although she was enslaved, Throughout her life, Bette exhibited a strong spirit and sense of self. She was anything but meek and didn't hesitate to offer physical resistance when need be. One time, it was cold outside, but the glowing fire in the brick oven warmed the kitchen as Bette busied herself baking the week's bread for her enslavers, Colonel John Ashley and his wife Hannah. Her younger sister Lizzie, also enslaved in the Ashley household, was too frail for heavy labor so she watched as Elizabeth stirred the fire with an iron shovel. As she carefully placed the loaves in the oven, Lizzie scraped a bit of leftover dough from the mixing bowl and formed it into a tiny loaf that she put alongside the others to bake. When the bread was done, the lady of the house, Hannah, came to inspect Beth's work. As she did, she spied Lizzie sitting near the hearth with her little crust of bread. Thief, she cried as she took the iron shovel, still hot from the fire, and raised it over the terrified girl. Catherine Maria Sedgwick, who was later raised by Elizabeth and was very close with her, wrote an article in 1853 about Beth's life of servitude and had this to say about what happened next. Quote, Bet interposed her brawny arm and took the blow. It was quite across the arm to the bone, but she would say afterwards in concluding the story of the frightful scar she carried to her grave, Madam never again laid her hand on Lizzie. I had a bad arm all winter, but Madam had the worst of it. I never covered the wound, 
And when people said to me before madam, why Betty, what ails your arm? I only answered, ask madam. Cedric ended this short tale with the words, which was the slave and which was the real mistress. The power behind this line is fueled by words allegedly spoken by Bet herself. Madam knew when I set my foot down, I kept it down. According to Sedgwick, Bet's character was composed of few but strong elements. Action was the law of her nature, and conscious of superiority to all around her, she felt servitude intolerable. It was the humiliation of the harness, the irresistible longing for liberty. John Ashley, Bet's master, was a Yale-educated lawyer, wealthy landowner, businessman, and leader in the community. His house was the site of many political discussions and the probable location of the signing of the Sheffield Declaration, a petition against British tyranny and manifesto for individual rights. The declaration was drawn up as a series of, of resolves approved by the town of Sheffield, Massachusetts on January 12, 1773, and printed in the Massachusetts Spy or Thomas's Boston Journal on February 18, 1773. The Declaration's first resolution was that, quote, Mankind in a state of nature are equal, free, and independent of each other, and have a right to the undisturbed enjoyment of their lives, their liberty, and property. The 1781 Berkshire County case of Brom and Bett v. Ashley, often referred to as the Mum Bett or Elizabeth Freeman case, was unique because the case was a direct challenge to the very existence of slavery in Massachusetts. This case occurred less than one year after the adoption of the Massachusetts Constitution, and unlike prior freedom suits, there was no claim that John Ashley, the slave owner, had violated a specific law. Before the state of Massachusetts adopted a constitution, slaves were considered both as property and as persons before the law. This meant that an enslaved person could institute and prosecute lawsuits in the courts against their master, the defendant, who would be required to demonstrate their lawful title to ownership of their slave. By 1780, nearly 30 slaves had sued their master for their freedom, most during the years following 1764. However, these cases were not decided on the basis of any natural right to freedom. Instead, the courts required a specific point of law to decide in favor of a slave, such as a master's broken promise to grant freedom or the questionable slave status of the individual's mother. According to later stories often told about Bet, her freedom suit was prompted by her overhearing dinner table conversations in the Ashley home about the new promises of liberty made in the Sheffield Declaration of 1773, the Declaration of Independence, and the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780. Because there are a lot of parts of Bet's story that aren't clear, other reports suggest that her suit was prompted when Bet's mistress, Mrs. Hannah Ashley, struck and burned Bet causing her to flee. When Mr. Ashley sought to reclaim his, quote, property, Bet reportedly sought help from prominent local attorney Theodore Sedgwick. Catherine Maria Sedgwick had this to say, quote, It was soon after the close of the Revolutionary War that she chanced at the village meeting house in Sheffield to hear the Declaration of Independence read. She went the next day to the office of Mr. Theodore Sedgwick, then in the beginning of his honorable political and legal career. Bet had this to say to Mr. Sedgwick, quote, Sire, she said, I heard that paper read yesterday that says, all men are born equal, and that every man has a right to freedom. I am not a dumb critter. Won't the law give me my freedom? Theodore Sedgwick had often visited the Ashley home and was clerk of the committee that had drafted the Sheffield Declaration. As one historian notes, quote, it is also possible that a group of prominent residents of Berkshire County selected Elizabeth and a Negro man, Brom, who was associated with her in the suit, to, in order to determine whether or not slavery was constitutional in Massachusetts after the adoption of the new constitution. Whatever the case may be, we know that Bet approached Mr. Sedgwick with her situation and Sedgwick accepted her case. 
The case was called Brahmin Bet versus Ashley because another enslaved person in the Ashley home, a man named Brahm, was also suing for freedom. Procedurally, the case began in May 1781 when the attorneys for Bet and Brahm, Sedgwick and a lawyer named Tapping Reeve, the founder of Litchfield Law School, one of America's earliest law schools, obtained a writ of replevin, an action for the recovery of property from the Berkshire Court of Common Pleas. The writ ordered Ashley to release Bet and Brom to the sheriff because they were not Ashley's legitimate property. Two writs were sent to Ashley and his son John, but Ashley refused. He claimed, quote, a right of servitude in the persons of the said Brom and Bet. When the case was tried in August 1781 before the County Court of Common Pleas in Great Barrington, Sedgwick argued that the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 had outlawed slavery. The jury needed only a short time to decide that Brahm and Bet were not and had never been Ashley's property. The court set Bet and Brahm free and awarded them 30 shillings damages. Mr. Ashley naturally filed an appeal, but he dropped it in the fall most likely after the Massachusetts Supreme Court ruled in another case that slavery was unconstitutional under the state constitution. Catherine Maria Sedgwick recorded Bet as once having said, quote, Anytime, anytime while I was a slave, if one minute's freedom had been offered to me, and I had been told I must die at the end of that minute, I would have taken it. Just to stand one minute on God's earth, a free woman, I would. For the first time in her life, Bet had a minute's freedom and more. She was now in the position to be the architect of her own destiny, along with God's helping hand. Bet's life as a free woman would certainly not be easy at all, and this was a fact she was well aware of. But that didn't matter because Bet was finally free. Once she gained her freedom, Bet changed her name to Elizabeth Freeman. John Ashley tried to get Elizabeth to continue living in his home as a paid servant, but she refused his offer. For the rest of her working life, Elizabeth instead served as a paid domestic in the household of Theodore Sedgwick and his second wife, Pamela, first in Sheffield and later when the family moved to Stockbridge. She became a surrogate mother to the children of Theodore, whom affectionately called her Mum Bet. When Catherine Maria was born, Mumbet recalled that at birth Catherine was, quote, as fair as a London doll. Of all of the Sedgwick children, Catherine would become closest to Mumbet. A few years after Mumbet began working for the Sedgwick family, a group of marauders broke into the house demanding the family's top quality liquor and all the valuables. Mumbet faced them down. With Theodore Sedgwick away, she had hid the valuables in her own chest of drawers. After leading the unruly men from room to room, she shamed them out of looking in her chest by urging them to do just that. Thus, she saved the family valuables. Catherine remembers this as an example of Mumbet's quick wit and nerves of steel. Quote, Such a resolve as hers is like God's messengers, wind, snow, and hail, irresistible. But the whole interaction with the group of marauders also revealed that Mumbet knew racism was still widespread in her community whether she was free or not. Mumbet was the main pillar of the household, according to Catherine Maria. In my childhood, Catherine recalled, I clung to her with instinctive love and faith, and the more I know and observe of human nature, the higher does she rise above the others, whatever may have been their instruction or accomplishment. Pamela, Theodore's wife, has slipped into severe depression, and Mumbet was, quote, the only person who could tranquilize my mother when her mind was disordered. She treated her with the same respect she did when she was sane. Her superior instincts hit upon the mode of treatment that science has since adopted. Sadly, Pamela Sedgwick died in 1807, and some scholars believe she killed herself due to her depression. <laughs> We just want to take a moment to speak about Theodore Sedgwick, the lawyer who represented Elizabeth Freeman in her freedom case. A few years after Freeman's trial, 
Theodore was elected as representative to Congress from Massachusetts's first congressional district. Over time, Mr. Sedgwick also represented Massachusetts's second district, serving until 1796. That year, he was elected to the United States Senate and served until 1799. In 1799, he was re-elected as a representative, this time from the 4th District, and was then elected the 6th Speaker of the House, serving until March 1801. In 1802, Sedgwick was appointed a Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. He held this position until his death on January 24, 1813. Mombet became widely recognized and in demand for her skills as a healer, midwife, and nurse. She worked for the Sedgwick family for about 27 years before retiring in 1808. This was around the time that Mr. Sedgwick got remarried after the death of his wife Pamela about a year before. Mombet had been close to Pamela, but had also been given considerable freedom to manage both the household and her own time during Pamela's long illnesses. With the arrival of the new Mrs. Sedgwick, Mombet became, quote, resolutely determined to leave the family. Sedgwick's children were horrified and hurt that their father planned to marry so quickly after the death of their mother, Pamela. They also did not approve of Miss Russell, whom they considered a squanderer who was only interested in the Sedgwick fortune. Against his children's wishes, Sedgwick married Russell on November 7, 1808. Nonetheless, Mombet remained extremely close to the Sedgwick family because, as Catherine put it, Mombet was, quote, a necessary link in the family chain. In a letter written nine years after the death of Pamela Sedgwick, Frances Sedgwick Watson, writing to her brothers Henry and Robert, informed them that, quote, our faithful and good old mother is the nurse of comfort of Charles's sick lad. She sends her love to you and Harry. Mombet saved enough money to buy her own home and lived there for the rest of her days. Catherine recalled that when she visited Mumbet at her home daily during her final illness, quote, I felt as awed as if I had entered the presence of Washington. Even protracted suffering and mortal sickness could not break down her spirit. On October 18, 1829, Mombet signed, with her mark, her last will and testament. While the will does not name a husband, it does reveal the names of her daughter, granddaughter, and great-grandchildren. While there are many theories out there as to who was the father of Mombet's daughter, there is no solid evidence currently available. At the time of her death, Mombet's property did not have a single debt and was valued at nearly $1,000, which is almost $32,000 today. Included in her will was a list of Mumbet's household and personal possessions, which she left to her family members. Some items included were, quote, household furniture, gowns, gold jewelry, and crockery. A copy of Mumbet's will exists at the Sheffield Historical Society in Sheffield, Massachusetts. The names of her daughter, granddaughter, and great-grandchildren are as follows. Daughter, Elizabeth. Granddaughter, Marianne Dean. Great grandchildren Amos J. Van Schack, Lydia Maria Ann Van Schack, Anne Dean, and Mary Elizabeth Dean. Elizabeth Mumbet Freeman died three days after Christmas on December 28, 1829. She was buried in the Sedgwick family plot in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. The Sedgwick family is buried in a circle, known as the Sedgwick Pie. It is said that the graves are arranged in a circular fashion so that on Judgment Day, when all arise from their graves, Sedgwicks will only gaze on Sedgwicks. And yet, Freeman remains the only non-Sedgwick buried in the Sedgwick plot. Shortly before she passed, Mumbet was visited by the clergyman of the village and he asked her, quote, are you not afraid to meet your God? No, sir, she replied calmly and emphatically. No, sir, I have tried to do my duty and I am not afeard. Fourteen months after Elizabeth's death, Theodore Sedgwick Jr. gave a lecture titled 
The Practicability of the Abolition of Slavery. In this lecture, Theodore refers to Mombet, stating, quote, if there could be a practical refutation of the imagined natural superiority of our race to hers, the life and character of this woman would afford that refutation. She had nothing of the submissive or the subdued character which succumbs to superior force and is the usual result of the state of slavery. On the contrary, without ever claiming superiority, she, uniformly, in every case, obtain an ascendancy over all those with whom she was associated in service. 24 years later, Catherine Maria Sedgwick had this to say about Mumbet in her writings. Elizabeth was a guardian to the childhood, a friend to the maturity, a staff to the old age of those she served. She had passed from the slavery of spiritual conventionalism into the liberty of the children of God. The Sedgwick family provided Elizabeth with a tombstone, inscribed as follows. Elizabeth Freeman, also known by the name of Mumbet, died December 28, 1829. Her supposed age was 85 years. She was born a slave and remained a slave for nearly 30 years. She could neither read nor write, yet in her own sphere she had no superior or equal. She neither wasted time nor property. She never violated a trust nor failed to perform a duty. In every situation of domestic trial, she was the most efficient helper and the tenderest friend. Good mother, farewell. Thank you for listening to the last episode of season one and I hope you enjoyed it. Each episode of Hidden History will explore a story that has been hidden in the pages of history and needs to be told. Pictures, newspaper clippings, and links to external articles relating to a particular episode will be available on our website. Season 2 of Hidden History will cover victims and heroes of the Holocaust, and the first episode of that season comes out in March. We here at Hidden History just want to thank everyone who has supported us throughout this first season of the podcast. We truly appreciate the support and hope you will continue to tune in to episodes of Hidden History in the future. Thanks again for listening. I'm John Rodriguez, and this has been Hidden History, an Odyssey Through Time.